let's do it. So we are located in Stone Ridge, as John mentioned many minutes ago. We have 11 acres of gardens. Our whole goal with Fortis Arboretum and Botanical Garden is to have the most diversity of plantings in Ulster County. We are currently a level two arboretum. And that means that a majority of our woody taxa has labeled. It also means that our whole end goal with the gardens is to be Ulster County's Arboretum Botanical Garden in 20 plus years or so, when we realized that Ulster County did not have a place such as this. For now, during COVID, we are open by appointment Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, as well as some special circumstances if you reach out to us. And at the end of our slideshow slide show presentation, we'll have our website so that if you don't know about us, you can sign on to an emailing list where we, um, about once a month, we'll share information about different talks that we're doing and different events, although, albeit right now, Obviously, we're not giving tours and such. And these are just some images of the garden. Um, tonight, we're gonna to be talking about native edible plants, fruits and nuts. But as John mentioned earlier on, we have all different types of plants. We have an emphasis on edible gardening, as well as an emphasis on plants that don't typically or aren't typically thought of as growing in our hardiness zone, which uh, if you don't know already is a zone six environment, at least where we are in Ulster County. We have a lot of plants that are zone seven. We have some that are zone eight. In the past, what we've been able to do is offer edible landscaping classes through um, the nonprofit Wild Earth. And we look forward to doing that again in the future. We also allow guests to come in and try fruit. The whole idea about that is that if you tried something that you've heard of, let's say gooseberries, we betcha that you're gonna wanna plant that in your garden. So it's all about inspiring people to kind of plant outside the, the box of what they already know. We offer classes, we offer tours, we do artist residencies. We have a fall artist residence so that if you know someone who might be um, wanting to stay for a week and have full access 24 seven to use the gardens for their visual art creative practice, um, you can find out more about that on our website. Whoops, excuse me, going the wrong way. This is Scott giving a class. And we're going to go straight into the presentation, and Scott will start off. Yes, uh, this is American chestnut, uh, Dunstan. Most people know that the American chestnut was wiped out in the United States by a blight, which was brought in on probably Japanese cultivars that were planted by the Brooklyn Botanical Garden accidentally. Uh, the Asian cultivars are are immune to the blight, but American plants aren't and were killed off. And in the 1950s, a man named Howard Dunstan began to take American chestnuts, which had survived the blight, and then they crossed pollinated those with American chestnuts. Uh, excuse me, they took American chestnuts that had survived the blight and crossed them with improved Chinese fruit cultivar uh, uh, nut um, chestnuts. So then he got trees which were half Chinese and half American. And then after many years, he crossed back once again to American. So what he ended up with are basically trees that are about 70% American, 80% American, and 20% Chinese to survive the blight. And those are Dunstan chestnuts. Um, and we've had Dunstan chestnuts about eight years. In the last three years, they started producing edible, high, very high quality nuts. The thing you want to know is that you're going to need at least two trees for pollination to get nuts. The nuts are very flavorful and delicious. And when they get to this point where there's, the husks are starting to, to ripen and crack open, you need to get to them before uh, squirrels and chi um, chipmunks do because they will reach your trees. So you can pick them slightly early when they're about at this point and bring them into your house. Um, in a box and just let them ripen over a period of a month or so, and then you can eat them like that. That's, that's the point at which it's good to, um, to get 
to get them. And in this image, you can kind of see, I showed it earlier, the dried flower stem there. So these plants are, um, the male part, yeah. yeah, this is the male part. And that's the female, the fruit forming there. Beautiful plants, yeah. large. You need some space for these. Probably gonna, American chestnuts are gigantic. Chinese chestnuts are kind of in between, are maybe 40, 20, 20, yeah, 30, 30 40. 40. And I think these are gonna end up halfway between maybe 40, 50 feet by 40 feet. They seem to be almost as wide as they are tall. Mm -hmm. Broad spreading trees, very beautiful, very handsome. Here you could see that the nutshell, the nut has already fallen, so. And some lucky squirrel has taken it away. Wasn't basically. us. Obviously you're going to need gloves or some sort of tool, but this is not something you wanna kinda of start touching with your hands. It's very prickly. Formidable, yes. Yeah. This is American hazelnut. And if you're a forager or someone who spends a lot of time out in our beautiful wood, wooded areas, um, you can see this. We've seen this um, present on different rail trails. And um, the forms of the, of the, these are multi-trunked shrubs, not necessarily a tree, are pretty variable, can get to 20 to 30 feet, depending on their particular aspect. This is the catkin. This is the male part of the plant. Beautiful. And so this actually is forming now, and I'll show you an image shortly of what they look like. Um, they're present on the plant. But this is in, uh, you can see it's deciduous, so it's probably March of this year. Some more pictures of the catkins. Highly ornamental. A lot of times people forget that edible fruiting plants um, are completely ornamental as well. And we don't really see a difference between the two other than an edible plant. You can obviously eat um, the fruit or the nut um, or wildlife will if it's something that you don't care for. And there's a lot of variability in the, the male catkins. I wanted to just show you this. I took this picture of me being the last week. This is the catkins forming now. To open the following year. Yeah. And then here is a photo of the female flower. And I um, just use this little kind of, just to kind of show you how small it is. So it kind of does make sense when you have these male catkins flowing in the wind. Um, this is really a, you know, kind of like corn in the way that it's, it is dependent on wind to kind of move it around as well. Beautiful plants. Again, just showing you the flower bud. And um, this is a really great nut plant. This is the, um, it in its husk, highly decorative again. The American is one of those plants we're speaking about native, but just as an FYI, if you happen to already have a European or even um, a cultivar of a American one that's been crossed, they are all compatible so that they can all produce nuts together. So you don't just have to have the American variety if, if you want to kind of expand on that. These are very adaptable to soil and to aspect. So they can take a part shaded environment. Um, I do feel that the little bit more sun that they're provided will produce um, better crop. Um, the more sun you do give them, maybe you need to have them in an area that is a slightly more moist, but we kind of have ours in a pretty like shaded area in um, meaning like it gets six to eight hours of full sun. So it gets sun in the morning and then toward the latter part of the day, it's more shaded, but it still produces fruit for us and absolutely stunning and gorgeous. So we try to get to stuff before the critters do. And so we've tried lots of techniques over the years because we've been doing this for quite some time now. I think the plant that we're looking, we're showing you is maybe 16 to 18 years old. Um, one of the things that we've come to learn is that by shaking the tree, especially in the morning, you can kind of harvest the nuts before the squirrels or chipmunks. So that might be a way to get it rather than them off, which is something we've tried in the past, but we find that the nut isn't always fully developed. 
So trying to lead them on as long as possible before the animals get to them is actually a really good um, strategy. And once they get shuck off the tree, often bringing, like like the, the chestnut, bringing them into the um, house for maybe a, for letting them ripen works. And in terms of pollination, you need at least two bushes. You can have more than that, but at least two for cross-pollination. Mm -hmm. And this is just a, to show you another variety. We found this when we were out foraging on the side of the road. So there is a lot of variability with what's out there. American persimmon, uh, Diasporus uh, virginiana. Uh, the most important thing you're, when you're getting American persimmon tree is you want to get a self-fertile cultivar. Uh, otherwise, you're going to have to have unsexed trees in the wild and they could take up to 10 years to, to start being productive. And you're not gonna know if you have male or female trees. So it's better to get a reliable one that's gonna get you um, the fruit. Um, so a single tree will get you fruit. Planting groups of them, one or two together would get you even more fruit, but um, a self-fertile cultivar will work. We love uh, John Rick, um, you know, J-O-H-N, R-I-C-K, John Rick. Um, that's a wonderful uh, self-fertile cultivar. For people who don't have a lot of room and have only a small garden spot, Zucchus, which is spelled S-Z-U-K-I-S, -S, that's, that's a fairly good small dwarf tree that produces huge amounts of fruit and tends to grow only inches a year. Um, and then the one you're gonna see in stores uh, which is okay, but it's not as good as the first ones I mentioned is meter. And that must be because it's easier to graft. And that's spelled M-E-A-D-E-R. Um, otherwise, you want to make sure you know the f fertility requirements. American persimmons must be dead ripe to eat, which means the fruit kind of takes on a, um, a like a pudding-like quality. And the flavor to me is not as sweet as an Asian persimmon, but it's richer. Delicious. Yeah, it has a butterscotch molasses kind of flavor. Um, wonderful. The best way is again shaking the tree, going out in the morning and, and two or three drop off the tree at a time. And the ones on the ground are always the sweetest and ready to eat. So you just have to check it regularly over a period of weeks. And you can see in this photo, the leaves have already dropped from the persimmon tree. I don't know if it was a stress thing or it's just the timing. Um, it looks like it's fall because yeah, the pawpaws in sorry, the background sorry, are also turning lot, yellow. Yep. It's becoming the fall. So the nice thing about these, um, this particular tree is that you can let the fruit fully ripen on the tree and then harvest it when it's ready, which is kind of in this photo, you can kind of see yeah. the wrinkling happening when the skin just starts to crack and you're seeing some dark spots on the fruit. We actually have to race to the trees before our dog gets there because she loves them so much. Uh, and these don't seem to be hit by squirrels mm -hmm. and chipmunks yeah. as much. They get a little bit chewed on. You'll find a well, few. Well, we'll see about this year because it was an awful year for chipmunks. But these but yeah. are not typically hit very hard mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to other things which are hit very hard, like the nut trees. Mm -hmm. These are kind of left alone. And do that's what... Um, sorry, do you have to um, spray those with anything? Or are these no, are, um, no, not at all. No. Actually, pretty much everything we're showing you, one of the things that we've come to terms over growing plants um, for the last 20 years has been, we are really trying to move away from spraying as much as possible. And you'll see when, if you, to follow us, we really don't talk too much about apples or peaches, some of those kind of fruiting trees that require a little bit more um, assistance in terms of, um, growing them successfully. So a lot of the things that we focus on are plants that are just easier to maintain, lower maintenance. That doesn't mean that we don't like take care of them. We really believe in feeding our trees and shrubs with compost, not only in the beginning part of the season, but also during the mid part of the season. So we're constantly building up the layers of soil um, for our trees. And we also do spoil newer plantings by watering them. And especially this year has been super dry. So the, that's- Yeah, the, yeah. the single worst thing you can do when you put a new tree in mm -hmm. is not watered enough. Yeah. 
the, the, the second worst thing you can do is allow thick grass to grow right up right. against it. Grass secretes a chemical compound which retards and often kills trees. Grass often kills trees more than deer do. So we tend to have well-weeded, spoiled trees, which means there's a four-foot circle around the trunk that nothing ever gets near it. That means I can see if there's pests, I can see if it's dry. I, I don't let anything get near the trunks of my trees, so which is how I tend to differ from permaculture practices, which kind of interplant things around everything. And I see more damage from that kind of practice than probably anything else. By that, I mean, if you're a critter like a bull and you want to attack a tree, letting thick foliage grow around the bottom of the trunk of the tree is the best way for a critter to get into a tree. So we tend to keep them clean. So what about mulch? Uh, mulch, yes, mulch is also great. Um, for the first two or three years, a thick mulch is great. And we tend to use soil as a mulch or compost as a mulch as the trees get larger. Mm -hmm. So um, when you say there's nothing underneath the tree, no grass, um, are you saying there's dirt? Yes, dirt. So there's clean, dry dirt from the trunk of the tree spreading out into a circle that's, that's I, around the tree. I think as we go through this, you'll see some images and they're pretty indicative of how we tend to keep our trees, the circle around, so that might be helpful. I'll point it out if, um, as we move forward. Uh, but I, once oh. again, on what she just said, 90% of the plants tonight, mm -hmm. almost 99, are, are pest free. Mm -hmm. they're, they're, they don't have major problems. Right. Persimmons have tiny little scylla, flies that attack the leaves, but those are like a cosmetic thing and they don't affect the fruit. food production. So every fruit tree has a little pest, mm -hmm. but not a major one. Mm -hmm. Not as if you're talking about something like peaches, there's hundreds of problems. Well, I think this is actually a really good segue because yes. this plant, well, you're supposed yes. to talk yes. on this, but this we had some issues yes. with. Yes, these are American beach plums. Again, this is one of the few wild plums that don't have any major pests, except this year, chipmunks. Well, don't get ahead of yourself. Yes, chipmunks. Well, we'll get yeah. there. Yes. But look at how gorgeous this is. Again, this whole ornamental quality of a fruiting shrub spectacular beautiful flower displays often thousands of blossoms in spring very very nice uh, you need two uh, uh, trees tree, two bushes for pollination uh, these are generally grow maybe 10 by 10 yeah. 8 by 8 full sun full sun these do not need a beach although they're called beach plums what they need is well-drained soil that's the most important thing these don't want to sit in boggy wet soil as long as it's well-drained soil, it doesn't really matter. We have really lousy clay soil, yeah. which has been mm -hmm. amended with compost, and these are thriving and produce thousands of little tiny wild plums. And I think you could see in this photo what we were talking the about, ground. how we keep um, the area around the plants clear. There's no weeds there. And this is an old established um, hedge. I think beach plums make a great living hedge for privacy. Um, if you didn't care for these slightly larger than cherry sized plums, wildlife loves them. Here's an image to kind of show you when they're um, green. And they need full sun. And, and John, as you can see the bottoms of the trees, how they're mm -hmm. just cleared around them. That's what I was talking about by weeded, mm -hmm. plant cleared. Would you say, since we're back on that subject again, would mm -hmm. you say that to be true for all trees? Or yes, yes, for, yes. You know, for us, that's, that's, yes. that's what we espouse. And that's yeah. what we found has, has been um, really helpful in terms of diagnostic when there's issues with the plant. As all, and we also like, quite frankly, the aesthetics. We are an Arboretum Botanical Garden. We're a showcase place. So this is what we'd like for people to kind of see. And um, trunks can be beautiful as well. The bark is gorgeous. So. And this is it fruiting earlier this season. You can see it's kind of copious amounts of fruit on this. And this is the fruit starting to change color in July. Beach plums have kind of a flavor to me that's yeah. likened with berry and plum mixed. It's almost like a conquered grape mixed with a plum. Again, tiny and humble, but delicious. delicious. And the flavor is variable. Sometimes it's extraordinary and rich, and sometimes it's mediocre and better for jam. Generally speaking, the larger the plum, 
those tend to have more sugar and are bitter. And their color is variable, sometimes yeah, black, sometimes here, right? blue, yeah. sometimes purple. And again, not many major pests except. Except for this year. <laughs> well, actually we've had this happen where we've left for a long weekend, but this week, this time we didn't leave anywhere. In fact, we even bought cloth to protect the, um, the over 2000 pieces of fruit that we had on this edible shrub. And within two days, I would say that the, we believe it was chipmunks pretty much wiped out all of the fruit except for like four pieces. And that's Allison, what, what about the black knot fungus? I've had a lot of problems on plums with that. Yes, if, but that's not, most likely you've had that on European plums, I would suspect. Um, I'm not saying that beach plums don't exhibit that. Yeah. Uh, black knot occurs in small amounts on this, but not major. Not like if it's cut and, and pruned away, it shouldn't be a major problem. Um, most of the, we have a large collection of plum trees and I'm getting out of the business of, of growing plum trees because so many of them are affected by diseases. And for those of you who don't know, because there's wild cherries in our forest, they pass all their diseases onto peaches, apricots, plums, etc. Cherries. Yeah, but these ones don't seem as it's bad. Affected. Again, if you see black knot, if you cut and prune it out and are judicious, it shouldn't be a major problem. If you let black knot go for two or three years and don't deal with it, it'll take over almost any prunus and wipe it out. This is Ribes Americanum, also known as American black currant. And our actual original couple specimens we found during um, a walk in the woods. This is absolutely, I love this fruit. Um, I love also its flowers in early spring where it's highly decorative, small little flowers, but when it, it's completely over, I just should go back a little bit, just when it's completely over the, the shrubs, it's um, very ornamental. It's like little chains of flowers hanging, little bells. You do need more than one plant for pollination, so you should have two or three. And this is the fruit that is um, ripening on what they call strigs. The fruit generally ripens over a three-week period of time, which is kind of nice so that you're harvesting um, over you know two to three weeks and you're sharing generally with the birds which technically is not a problem. Um, this is sited in a more part shade location so one of the few fruiting bushes that doesn't mind not being in a full sun and really full sun means anywhere when we're in the height of summer from eight to what, 14, yes, 12 hours? 14, yeah, yeah, a lot. Not yeah. six, but eight. Yeah. When you're going under that, which is this could be at certain times between six to eight hours at its minimum of sunlight, it's, this is fine and probably even prefers it unless you have a wet site. Um, but it's very adaptable to different types of soil. So that's kind of nice. A lot of people um, ask about the ribes in terms of um, their was for a long time, it was banned in New York State as well as the rest of the United States for selling more so at the turn of the century because of the white pine industry. I know that recently, maybe la last two years, uh, people have said that um, even Francis over at Catskill Native that he was having difficulty finding um, black current availability for market and maybe New York State had put some restriction yes. on that. Um, so I'm not really sure where it's at now, but it does grow naturally wild and has naturalized in our woods. I think it's a great tasty plant. It's one of the fruit fruits that my husband does not care for, so it's kind of nice. I get most of it and I eat it out of hand. It is, um, has a lot of vitamins and nutritive um, properties to it, makes it really tasty jam. And as I said, there's generally plenty on my bush except for this season where once again, um, it wasn't the birds that ate it all, it was also um, chipmunks. So that was really frustrating to go out and only have 20 when normally I can make a couple pints of jam out of that. And then this image is um, another type of ribes, um, American. It's called clove currant. 
and it's this particular cultivars crandles this was bred basically because this fragrance of the flowers is super perfumey and intense whereas our native species is not um, aromatic that way so I have two planted in an area where I walk by pretty frequently and they're slightly shaded by some larger trees again they don't need a full sun the flowers are fairly larger I don't think I included an image of the fruit but the actual berries um, are larger than our native species and taste just about the same and so again this is, this is native but yes. not to this area maybe this is a midwestern mm -hmm. plantarum or southern right. plant but it's an American plant. right we didn't even talk about what native means maybe at the end we can discuss the stretchiness of that word what did you say this was called this one is called Crandall's. It's called Clove Current, and Crandall is the cultivar. Uh, American elderberry, which is a wonderful plant. It's humble and not, and maybe not valued that much as a landscaping plant, which is unfortunate because it produces massive quantities of food and medicine and drinks and grows in the absolute worst conditions. It thrives in sandy soil, it thrives in bogs, it th thrives in clay soil, and it produces large amounts of food even in sh shady environments. Mm -hmm. It can grow in full sun or shade. Uh, flowers can be used medicinally, can be used for brewing wine, can be made into a fermented non-alcohol drink like a cordial. And our favorite is when you have a neighbor come over and fry them up. It's a fritter, which is a big uh, Eastern European treat. Which is absolutely wonderful. Delicious. <laughs> um, I'm a f the flowers are extremely ornamental. The plants are beautiful. They can yeah. get large. Yeah. We had, you'll see very soon in by these slides, a bird pooped out a seed many years ago and we have a gigantic huge bush. I had nothing to do with that. That bush is now about 20 feet by 20 feet. It's a big Easily, glorious yeah. bush um, that gets completely covered with fruit. And that's growing in bad soil and, and in, in part shade. In I part mean, shade. Part Maybe shade, yeah. four hours of sunlight. Mm -hmm. It's glorious. So, mm -hmm. And my wife makes a cough syrup using the fruit cooked with cloves and um and sugar and then bottles it for the winter to make into teas for when we get sick this is the berries um, just starting to um ripen and develop and this is a, a berry that you're supposed to cook a little bit yeah you it's can't, slightly you toxic really can't it's meant it to be cooked yep. and once it's cooked it's perfectly safe uh, to eat but we know a lot of people who grow this and don't even harvest the fruit which i mean it's is fine plant, but it's a great you... wildlife birds absolutely love this plant yes our cat birds are delighted yes. and are constantly yeah. picking at yes. it and taking yeah. it yeah. and this bush is so large there's enough to share yeah. at this point we don't really care and again this is one of those things where it's highly ornamental so imagine you have a, a fairly large specimen that is just dripping of berries because this is their natural thing where the berries are so heavy that they fall over. There are two cultivars. One is called, well, there's more than two, pardon me. We grow two, but there's a several different cultivars that were bred. One, the ones that we're familiar with are York and Adams, and they produce a slightly larger berry with no taste. No, the taste is different. the same. They're yeah. just slightly bigger. Yeah. Um, a lot of people say, how do you harvest the fruit? Some techniques are you can, um, and the same with the flowers if you wanted to use them. A lot of people like the strategy of freezing the clusters, and then when they're slightly frozen, they shake it off. Um, but again, you can only have the berries. You can't really include the stems. You have to be pretty mindful. Because they're toxic. Yeah, they're toxic. Just another You can image. see that's yeah. so this is from a wild bush, just very, very productive. You know, there's, I don't know, hundreds of berries there with one plus. Let's of start counting. <laughs> uh, this is another wonderful native that is really not thought of as an edible. And I understand why it might not be, but it's silly because if you ever had an opportunity to eat a May apple, you would be like, how is this plant even a native? Because it tastes so tropical in flavor but I'm getting a little ahead of myself I just will start off by showing you the umbrella like foliage as it springs up in very early spring 
and you could kind of see it starting to um, kind of get a little bit larger and larger still. This is a, one plant that is pretty easy to recognize, this native plant. Our initial introduction to it was along a very large stretch of roadside where it was um, kind of slightly graded so that it doesn't mind being in kind of crappy soil on a grade along a road, so just kind of near beer bottles yeah, and yeah, trash, and garbage, and gravel. It, it spreads by rhizomes. Another, we love this for a while for our landscaping business. This was our um, kind of our um, logo. And we don't have photographs of the flowers, but yeah, the flowers are quite I, beautiful. I do, I'm sorry, I forgot to add in, but the flowers are gorgeous, they're like a simple white flower very pretty early on in the season. And here you could see an image of the fruit beginning, beginning to form. And you could kind of see in this image that the stem of this plant is growing between two stones. So it's a tough plant. This is technically considered a ground cover. Uh, it gets about uh, anywhere from eight inches to a foot, would you yeah, say, foot, in terms foot, of height? Yeah. It likes to be as an underground plant, so under, under, shade, under yeah. shade and under shrub, under tree plant. So it does really well and give it mm -hmm. some time, it will um, form a colony. We had this plant, most of our gardens are uh, really, all of the gardens are uh, planted with deer fencing around them. But many years ago, 15 years ago or so, we put a little stand of this in an unfenced area because we had read that May apples were toxic to deer. The foliage. The foliage, not the fruit. Poisonous. But we happened to have a family of deer that loved the foliage and left the fruit. So, um, but just showing you the fruit starting to develop. And right now, this picture was taken within the last week. So you could see the foliage is starting to die back and the energy is going to the fruit and um, as well as to the um, underground rhizomes. And again, the fruit goes from green to yellow and you know that it's ready to try when it gets a little squishy looking. And you could see in the ones that are not in my hand, they're kind of um, have that translucent look and a little bit squishy. So that is the pulp which you eat, but you can't eat the skin, nor can you eat the seeds. And you, I can see the seeds having been very familiar with this fruit, but um, you might not. So you just spit it out. But this pulp, my goodness, it tastes like you're having like you're somewhere in the Caribbean and you're um, Spicy it's and just tropical. tropical flavor. I can't even, sometimes we tend to liken um, tropical flavoring, flavored fruits to things that we're familiar with, but there's nothing I can liken this to. It just tastes like I should be at a beach with the ocean at my toes. It's delicious. Uh, wildlife does like this as well, but we have found in the past um, and even now that they are still persisting and when they fall from the plant itself, it's completely ripe and you could take it in. Yeah, you can't eat the fruit until it's squishy yeah. and the plant's almost died back and kind yeah. of going to sleep. Exactly. Um, I have a question. Um, yeah. yeah. How many years does it take from the seed uh, before you will get fruits? Uh, it's a slow growing yeah. plant, maybe five, six, seven. From seed, yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I've had a, a patch that I planted from seed for about four years now, I think. I haven't seen anything yet. And, and you haven't seen any fruit? I haven't seen any fruit yet. How tall are the, how tall are your plants right now? They, they finally last year got full size, um, eight, eight to 10 inches. Great. Yeah. That's but, great. Um, so yeah, you might get you might get flowers yes. pretty soon. Yeah. Yeah. And you might get flowers and not fruit. That's this pretty was about common. The first year that they that they got to their full height, but yeah. they yep. they die almost every year because I don't water them. And yeah, that's they, their habit. They don't like the drought period, yeah. and it's hard to keep them moist for, uh, during this this time right now. What so this is the I would say out of everything we're growing, this is the most <laughs> difficult in that this is a southern plant that we have gotten to survive and people up even in Minnesota have gotten it to survive. Passiflora incarnata is maypop, that's the Native American wild passion fruit. 
the secret to getting this to survive is to get a very thick root system. And then after you have a very thick root system, you plant it in the very best possible position, which means as much sun as possible, not a few hours of sunlight, but like eight, 10, you know, a large all day, and then have it in the, the best possible soil, rich, rich compost with maybe a little bit of manure, but much more compost, almost pure compost. And then if you can do that and plant it earlier in the season, and have it grow through one long season and then buried and mulched, it'll survive. Um, like if you plant it now, it's too late. If you plant it right after a frost, so it has a very long growing season, it might survive. So what I'm fond of telling people is if you really want this to survive, keep it as a house plant for two or three years. You buy two separate plants. You need two plants for cross-pollination. And if possible, get the two plants from different nurseries because you want them to be genetically different, like not from the same patch of seeds, because the more genetic diversity and the thicker the rhizome and the bigger the plant, the more you're gonna get the edible fruit from this. And this will produce edible passion fruit. So I say, if you can keep this as a, as a house plant, two, three years, and I've had them as house plants in a slightly sunny window, watered once a week through the winter. And then if you can get it big and vigorous, then it'll survive. This is the Alba which is the white kind of albino form of the passion fruit, which is also spectacularly, spectacularly beautiful. Again, every part of this plant is medicinal. It's, it was used by Native Americans. It's still used by herbalists. And then the flowers are followed up by these gigantic, beautiful passion fruits. We've had this fruit outside, but <laughs> sometimes they fall off the vine because of the shortness of the season. But we, um, made the good uh, stroke or bad mistake of putting this in our greenhouse. And because our greenhouse is like Georgia and Tennessee, which means it's 10 to 15 degrees hotter every day, this has rioted in our, passion, in our greenhouse, which means we have hundreds and hundreds of passion fruit and it has completely invaded every single bed of our greenhouse. It's taken many years. So that's why it's kind of a bad problem because we can see why down south this is considered a weed and invasive, um, even though it does produce really not the sweet tropical um, past. Semi, yes. Yeah, but they're semi sweet and we eat them out of hand. Um, they have a little bit of a tartness to them, which I find pretty refreshing. We make jam with it. We also do a hot sauce, I mean, it, but it's a, a great vine, but it's also it does come with spectacular flowers. Yes. Yeah, it comes with a lot of caution. I mean, this is absolutely gorgeous. This photo was actually taken of our specimens outside. And as Scott had mentioned, just to reiterate, planting them outside in our zone, it works. However, for the most part, the fruits don't fully ripen. So they, they, they have. Ha they have but because if you have a year where there isn't an early frost, you can yeah. get fruit. Yeah. But when you we had like two pieces of fruit, so you know, so, yeah. so yeah, so yeah. Um, but now we have a hundred, and we do have plants for sale. So you can, if you want to nurse one through the winter, you can pick one up from us, or if you want to come check in in the spring. Or see our greenhouse with hundreds yeah. and hundreds of passion yeah. fruit. You can come <laughs> in, happy to sh happy to share. And, and that's, that's what the, fruit, what looks the like. fruit looks like. So you eat the whole thing. It's actually really delicious. And it's, again, something you don't necessarily think of as a it, it, native fruit. It does taste like pa the, the, the tropical passion fruit that's from Jamaica. The difference is this lacks some of the citrus quality. Mm -hmm. So when I make jelly, I squeeze lemons and oranges into this to make it have that characteristic. Right. But wonderful. Yeah. Everything wonderful. But aggressive. Yes. Bully. Uh, uh, pawpaws. I would say this is kind of the queen of American fruit. Uh, tough, easy to grow. Um, the worst thing about this plant is it's going to take you 10, maybe 12 years to get to the fruit. And that's because this is a taproot driven plant that has to sit for a long time in, in, in the right situation. And once the roots have grown out long enough and the tree is comfortable, then it then it's almost like a switch turns on and you suddenly have fruit after many years of waiting. The other bugaboo about this and what makes it difficult for people is 
when pat when, when pawpaws are small they need a little shade they cannot be in full sunlight but once they're mature and they're full size they want to be in sunlight all day so you either put a baby plant in and then put a couple posts in with maybe a shade cloth for three or four years and let the plant get large and then remove the shade cloth one year or you try to grow a plant out and pot it out over and over and then like which is what i'm doing to grow them out which is a bit more of a pain in the neck and then pot it into the ground i'd say once pawpaws get about four feet they're okay and can be out in full sun but until that when they're babies they don't like full sun they tend to get fried and the first couple of years it might even start to flower which is we're showing you right here is a, a flower bud but you might not get the fruit either so be prepared it can be very exciting we've seen people who've been growing ones for eight or nine years get their first flower but no fruit yeah perfectly and, normal and grafted plants tend to get yeah. fruit quicker so you might be able to kick some years off by getting grafted variety but what a flower look yeah. at that is that not gorgeous just stunning and you can see the one on the right does not have the pollen so, ready yeah. the one on the left the pollen is cracked open and is ready mm -hmm. and there's a myth that these are only pollinated by carrion flies and that is a and that is like a common household fly it's not a carrion fly it's any flies blue bottle flies we've seen all sorts of different mm -hmm. flies pollinate these mm -hmm. and unfortunately um flies are lazy pollinators well it's very early spring so they're they but although he's got a lot of pollen on yeah so it, if yes. it's cold they do not pollinate well so sometimes i take a paintbrush and we'll take pollen from one plant and take it to another you do need two trees one is not enough um two trees or more um we and we have mitchell and taylor and and mango and then we have wild Straight, seedlings right yeah that we save and, the and, seeds and, from and the, the taste difference is the same a good yeah. ripe pawpaw is wonderful and it doesn't matter right a straight species might give you small medium and large is where a grafted one they and might maybe be a little less seeds i'd say or smaller seeds but i think the mm. seeds are kind of cool that's how we started a lot of our um plants and this you could see it kind of clusters not the same as a banana but similarly and the fruits are starting to develop and sometimes you can have a cluster that's two three four five it's um, pretty variable again that's all based on the pollination time and how cold or wet it was during the spring when the beautiful purple flowers were open and that's a cluster that's forming okay and the more. taste is kind of like oh, delicious see we're going to try and banana, describe banana, it to something else banana and coconut right. or banana and pineapple right I, I like them when they're mild flavored when they get older and darker and more spotted they take on more of a banana pudding kind of quality delicious oh my god i like them a little bit more ripe and a lot of people are like, well, why don't we see these more in the market? And I think you have to think about it like a banana, um, whereas most of the bananas that we get in the market have been shipped while they were green in trucks that have uh, gas to help ripen them. And then when they come to the stores, they're still lightly green but yellow, but you'll never see a fully ripe, really ripened banana um, in a store. You might see it in your house in your basket but for the most part you won't because the aesthetics of a yellow banana with black spots or you know supposedly people won't buy that um a lot of people like a banana that is more ripe they find it much sweeter to, to eat or to bake with think of pawpaws the same way the um, they are just too fragile of fruit in terms of having an economic value that way however in the Hudson Valley, excuse me, in the Hudson Valley, at least, there are a lot of growers that will share their produce at farmer markets at our food co-op. I know Davenport's will sell. They are truly a treat if you never tried one. Normally, we would do a tour during the time that we have them and um, open them, cut them up so people can taste. Um, because we feel like even though as Scott had mentioned early on that the they take a long time for them to produce fruit the wait for this particular one is well worth it phenomenal um, 
Yeah, and this was a, this is a native plant. Um, most people don't think that something in the custard family can taste like this. Yeah, this is native from um, mid the Michigan Peninsula and the upper Midwest down through the south. So I, we recognize that it's 7.30 and um, we have another half hour to go. We still have a bit more plants, but if anyone has any questions as we're moving along, please feel free to ask them as we, as we go. Um, this is Opuntia humifusa, also known as prickly pear, another um, plant that a lot of people don't think about as being a native plant to this area, but it is. And this is a picture of them, the paddles with new growth forming in the spring. And this is a fairly large specimen that's grown over time. And at the bottom right of the screen, you'll see four to five, what they call tunas, which are the fruiting parts of the cactus. Personally, we're not big uh, at least on this um, species of the fruit on this. For this one, we like to eat the paddles. And we've had a past tradition of coming out along the end of December. Well, I should since say we, I sent Scott out with gloves and um, tongs to harvest because they, you can kind of see they the have thorns. the thorns on them and that you could peel them and cut them up and they taste like a very sweet green bean. So they're quite lovely. And it's actually a good thing to do because once the plant kind of sprawls out, you want to kind of keep it in control. And this is the flowers, absolutely stunning, gorgeous, beautiful. So I don't know if you could tell in this photo, but this is in a lot of gravel for really good drainage. It does require to be in a full sun setting. Um, it is one of those kind of creeping plants that give it some room to spread. I guess technically it could be considered a ground cover. It's super easy to propagate where you just take a paddle off carefully and you basically harden the callus for a, a couple of days and then you can just stick it in the ground or share it to, with the neighbor. Um, and that, 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 is, that, that, that's a cultivar. Yeah. This is a different species. Mm -hmm. This is a Puncha feiacantha, which is a little bit more upright, like a paddle yeah. on top of a paddle. So this will get a little higher, maybe six, seven inches tall. And it has that beautiful orange glow in the center of the plant. Beautiful. And you can see the tuna on the bottom left, kind of, um, the, yeah, the fruit. kind of the fruit. The it's already colored. Would you say this was native to Northeast? I would say the mm -hmm. Faya Campa is, is, is more yeah. a Western desert plant, but it's mm -hmm. a Western desert plant that gets snow. Homofusa is from this the one. Catskills. I've heard people say there are rock outcrops in, in the Catskills. And in Kingston, right? Yeah, in Kingston. There's rare spots where you find this. Oh. Generally, the edges of cliffs and rock outcrops it can take snow laid over it, but it wants to be drained. You know, it yeah. wants to be that first spot that dries up in the middle of winter when things melt away. Um, if you came for a visit at the gardens, you would see ours are in um, areas that we've built up with gravel, raised with stone to, to really kind of enforce the good drainage. Yeah, I've seen people plant this in Straight bad spots. Straight in gra right, and not, and not have a problem either. Yeah, even, exactly. but, but it would be better if you did it. Yeah. There's probably 60 species of Apuncia. There's also Apuncia in the Great Lakes region near Michigan, which must be covered with feet of snow. Right. It's probably also there in Rocky Mountain out outcrops also. So there's a, several species that will, will survive in our area. And again, the main thing, I always say it's not the thorns, it's the, it's the glochids. The glochids are little tiny. If you see the little points emerging in the middle of the paddles, those are little gl glands that help the, the paddle as it grows. And those get little tiny hairs and the hairs do not come out when they stick in your skin. So the, the classic way to deal with these is to cut off a paddle and then take a big butcher knife and, and scrape sideways across the paddle to knock all that off. But with gloved hands. Yeah. yeah. Oh, you hold it with a barbecue tongue. Yeah. And then it just gets boiled lightly for 10 or 15 minutes. And then those 
are chopped and tossed into yeah. a stir fry. Right. It's a traditional Native American food. Again, if you blindfolded someone and they ate them, they would they would taste a sweet string bean flavor. Yeah. And I do like the, the fruit. The fruit has a kind of a strawberry um, uh, watermelon Sometimes, quality. Yeah. It's there. There are probably improved fruit cultivars. We don't have we them. We don't have that. Um, not, like, not yet. Not yet. <laughs> um, I, 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 lo I love this. Oh, but, I didn't put a title. I'm sorry, people. I thought uh, I had a title this is, on this. This uh, is Spikenard, Sarsaparilla, Aurelia race mosa. Oh, there it is. This I is, did fancy title. This is from the ginseng family. Uh, this is the traditional plant that people used to plant to make root beer. Um, so they would dig up the roots and use this. I've seen this in Kingston. I've seen it in the Catskill mm -hmm. Mountains. In, on, I've seen it in Mount Trimper. It likes shade, but most importantly, and to my frustration, it needs consistent moisture. There's a lot of reports that say this is just fine in part shade. And you can see in the background a few of the plants dying away. This does not like droughts. So I keep digging this plant and putting it in deeper more and deeper shade. in shade. So it wants it's to be in more shade. shade. Now, yeah. really. And the, the, to me, the most rewarding aspect of this plant isn't the roots, it's the berries. The berries are really remarkable. They have a spicy flavor that to me is sort of like blackberry mm -hmm. with a little bit of Tabasco sauce. But it's, the thing is, it also makes a beautiful ground yes. cover for a shady area or a woodland walk. I mean, look at the flowers. These are just starting to pop. And it's then, about four yeah. feet by four feet. It looks kind of like a shrub more mm -hmm. than, the, more than a perennial. And then the berries come around September and they're spicy. And I take the berries and I basically make a root beer kind of drink with them by cooking them down with a little sugar. They're really wonderful. Delicious. And again, this is in the ginseng family. So it's also probably very good for you. There's probably lots of minerals and vitamins mm -hmm. in it. It's a great... I seem to be the only person who champions the use of this plant. I just think it's a wonderful plant. I champion it for you too. Yeah. It makes it delicious um, drink. The berries are great out of hand as well. They're tasty. Really Do wonderful. You sell these? Do you sell these at your? I I think I have one baby. I uh, we have a couple of baby plants. Yes. Yeah. A little variability in the color depending on um, where we forage this or which plant. And there's we got also it from. poppy seeds. Uh, California yeah, poppy don't seeds mind those. Kind, of, kind of laying around Artistically. In my, I, when, I, when I grab the handful of these. Here's another wonderful um, shade loving shrub called spice bush, Lindera benzoin. Many of you probably have seen this if you're doing walks in the woods in early spring. This, I actually champion this plant a lot for for just like regular homeowners as a great shrub to put in instead of forsythia. For it flowers as early, even maybe two weeks earlier than forsythia does when we're all in need of some color. But unlike forsythia, it really is a great host plant for lots of different pollinators. And here you can see the flowers are beginning to open. The challenge about this plant is that it is dioecious, which means there are separate male plants and separate female plants. And trouble with that is that most places that do sell these plants haven't sexed out the plants. And you can tell by the size of the flower whether it's a male or a female plant. So what you have to do if this is something that you're interested in putting in your garden you would want to get two or three or maybe even four plants because one male plant will pollinate four to six plants if planted fairly close together. And here's an image of the shrub just starting to open up and you could see how dreary and wintry it still is out there and it's just very beautiful. Now the nice thing about this plant is that once the leaves start to to um, form out. The young leaves are often used um, in salads they're and they really have this great lemony, citrusy flavor. We've also used the leaves when they were slightly larger. They get a little tougher, but if they're ripped up, I don't really think it's a problem. You can make a tea out of it as well, but more often than not, it's used as an, uh, you know, an early pottage herb um, in salads and such. And this, as I had said, makes a great shade plant. It's an understory in our wooded area. 
However, it can take some sun as long as that there's a little bit of moisture given to it if you were wanted to put it in a full sun site. But I kind of think that's silly. Most of us do have areas that are shaded and would love to plant something that's edible in that shade area. And I think spice bush makes a great plant. It's not fussy necessarily in terms of soil and um, ours we just put directly into clay soil, which does have some also, moisture. Also, just really quickly, spice yeah. bush grows in our woods on the edges of rivers that's and right. streams. So that's another great thing. There's a lot of people who have slightly boggy soil mm -hmm. and shade, and there's very little that does well. And mm -hmm. spice bushes would be perfectly happy. Mm -hmm. Not standing water, no. but kind of wet, gooey soil mm -hmm. that's not Alluvial. very nice. Yep. Um, spice bush would thrive in that. We've also seen this growing along roads where it's on um, steep, on yeah, steep dra drainage. drainage. Yeah. So I feel like once it kind of settles in, it's highly adaptable. And this is the berries on a female plant. Um, the red part is the paracap. And what you do, and this is actually happening now, so we need to yeah, make note yes. of that. Yeah, and um, we go out and we collect the berries, and then you let them sit and dry for a couple of months. And the red part, the paracap, will turn black and shrivel a bit. And the colonists use this particular spice um, in lieu of pepper, black pepper, which was very expensive at the time. And quite frankly, this it has much works. more interesting flavor profile. It has got, feels allspice, a little bit of black pepper. Um, again, it's really, we're describing the flavor of this compared to other things, but it, it has a lot of notes, including citrusy, coriander. I find a lot of coriander. You can use it fresh, but I think the oils of it are much more potent as it dried. And, in the past, um, we've used it for malt cider, or if I'm using, like if I was doing a turkey or something, it's good for game. Uh, again, it, again, interesting. This is in, this is Lorisay. The Lorisay family has cinnamon, um, um, yeah, laurel, aromatics, laurel yeah. sassafras, and this. They are, the, the trees in that family produce spicy bark and spicy leaves as a deterrent for animals to eat them. So a lot of those are wonderful. Uh, spice bush, the leaves are aromatic, the bark is aromatic, everything, everything yeah. is wonderful. The flowers not so much so actually, yeah. but here's an image, um, I'm holding them and you can kind of see they're starting to ha you know, have some Wrinkle wrinkles blue. on it. Are these from uh, male or female? This is female. Yes. Yeah. It's a dioecious plant, so they're separate plants. It's either that, male or female. So you want to plant a couple produce, together. The females oh. produce the berries? That's correct. Yes. And, it, and it's very difficult when they're, when they're the first four or five years of their yeah. life, it's very difficult. They look exactly alike. They do. And then the flowers, you can tell when you see the flowers, not only size, but I believe that the boys do like, tend to do sprays of flowers. There's more and the girls are less flowers and they're, they're um, so you can kind of tell, but it's always best to put two or three of them together. They make a nice little hedge. They can get large. Um, in situ in the woods, I've seen them get 15 yeah. to 18 feet. Okay. Just showing you. That's a some, lot. That's a, lot. A day of collecting yeah. where we're going out and collecting. Actually, no, that's just from our own. Oh, no, yeah. But yeah, that's a long time ago. <laughs> um, Aronia. Uh, there's a couple of different species, so I just kind of chalked it all as one um, known as chokeberry. I believe this is Melancarpa. I'm kind of new to Aronia. We traveled um, yeah. a couple years ago and someone we kind of met along the way had introduced us to dried choke berries and was taking them for health reasons. And I thought they were absolutely delicious and he kind of converted me to all the health benefits. He was like, this is has the most health benefits than, you know, Elderberry yeah, yeah, and choke, blueberry. Aronia and, has the most anthrocyons of any food in the uh, world. The so purple, it's actually right? really good for you in terms of fighting cancers and stuff. It's very good for your health. And the, the, the um, I don't want to call it a problem, but the thing about Aronia is that it's really not something that you would eat out of hand. 
So it's one of those fruiting bushes that you really do need to have dried. Um, although or made into a we juice. or into a yeah. juice, I I will say we did find um, a shrub a couple years ago or even last year or whatever, and we I tried some out of hand and they were variable, but some of them were like absolutely delicious. So mm -hmm. I was like, oh, I want to have more of these in the garden. So there are a couple different cultivars out there. This is a recent picture, maybe in the last couple of weeks of the fruit starting to dry. And some of the cultivars, there's one called Viking, mm -hmm. there's one called Nero, they're, they're becoming popular. There's also dwarf kind of creeping varietals, so mm -hmm. there's a vari variety of there's, them now. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, I didn't realize I was going to have so much competition with the berries this year. Yeah. This year. So uh, in this image and toward the very back, you can kind of see there's some dark black ones, dark purple black. That is the stage where it's okay to pick. So Aronia does produce berries over a fairly long period of time, but we have stupid critters at Hortus and they're <laughs> harvesting fruit at when things aren't ripe. And we told you about the beach plum thing. They harvested those when they were still green. So maybe in two years, we'll have a very big booming beach plum collection for sale. Um, we'll see about that. I'm not so sure. Uh, cranberry, uh, Vaccinium macrocarpum. Uh, what what you can't see, well actually, yeah, you mm, can see can here. See. What we have, uh, we have a plastic container that is buried in the ground and then soil is put over it and then the cranberries are put inside of it. So this in essence is a little two by two foot bog so that the plants stay wet and, and can grow out over the edges of the container. So you, you don't need a quote unquote bog to get cranberries to grow. Um, you just need consistently moist, wet soil. Um, and they don't need to be standing in so wet, no. just wet, moist. Moist soil. Mm -hmm. And cranberries, if you and do- And acidic. Yeah, if you do mix your, your, your soil, it's one part soil, one part peat moss or an acidic soil and one part sand. And other than that, they grow slowly as a mat. It's good to cram them together because I would say the only problem with these is the fruit tends to be scattered on them. So you want a packed group of them to kind of grow, to get, grow together. I was curious, well, we're, we're in the midst of writing a book to be um, published in uh, 2022. So, um, sign up to know about that. But when we were doing our research, one of the things about cranberry, why it got its name are based on these little flowers that look like cranes. And I had never really identified them because they're super teeny. Um, but you could see um, in this image toward the back is a little fruit that is developing and forming. Um, I think they're also very beautiful. They are um, absolutely gorgeous. I like the way they creep and they're great as a ground cover. Again, mm -hmm. if you put this in a pot in the ground and it's hidden and then you have the creeping vines, they can be spread and moved right. out wherever you want them to be. They'll, they'll creep indefinitely. So it is, um, it is a, you know, a ground cover as Scott had mentioned. And here, I don't know if you could tell, but we put as a mulch for this, we've used pine needles to help with the acidity of the soil. And there are a couple different cultivars yeah. that are available. Pilgrim, Pilgrim is one yeah. of them. Yeah. And um, it's just a very easy, low care. Yeah, um, never done anything no, to this. I mean, we did have a while where, uh, I don't know if it was a vole. Yeah, but under the snow yeah. one year, a voles got into a patch of this and kind of decimated, cut it up. And and that's the only time we've ever had, had anything problem. major. Other than that, it just kind of does its own thing. And when the you can kind of see it, it just kind of grows a little bit viney so that when a tip of the plant hits soil it kind of roots up and starts again so it, it's kind of colonizing as a mat formation uh, full sun would be a preferable yes. yeah. for having major fruit production and the fruit pretty much ripens all around the same time which is September, really an end of September, September October yeah. um, depending on the environmental qualities of the year in terms of heat and stuff, but again, just to kind of give you an idea of what's happening in here. 
And that brings us to the end of our presentation. And just for if any of you kind of came late to the talk, um, you know, we do encourage visitors on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, and you can sign up by looking at our, <clears throat> pardon me, at our calendar on our website, which we put up. We recently turned the gardens after growing it out for about 20 years into a nonprofit garden. So your support coming to visit us is wonderful by either making a plant purchase goes to helping the maintenance of the gardens. If you like this talk, because this was um, a free talk on our end, and thank you to the town of Rochester for hosting this and for asking us to do this, you could go to our website and make a small donation. That's always appreciated as well. We hope to do this again in the future with the town of Rochester, maybe next year, talking about a different aspect of native gardening. Um, and yeah, do you want to add anything? Uh, yeah, and the reason she's saying about the sign up because of the COVID-19, yeah. we've been having people come like one family at a time. That, a way, they, people, that way they right. don't have to wear a mask. That's right. And they know there's only one or uh, us two out weeding. So they can be left alone and walk through the gardens open with the gates all open. Or have a party like a couple <laughs> of different groups have had because we have a little area that We're, we call the event center that yeah. has some picnic tables. So, so it allows people to come uh, at, at a limited slot of time. And, and one last thing is if you were here early on, John had mentioned about coming out and not really even knowing that we were here. And part of what I said earlier was, you know, we, we say it a lot, but it's true. We, Scott and I have just been doing a lot of the planting for the last 18, 19 years, just keeping our heads down, doing the work doing research about endangered plants that are not only native, but we're also interested in ones from other parts of the world and trying to see if we can grow them here. And I guess about five or six years ago, we really did realize that our county did not have an official Arboretum Botanical Garden in the sense that other counties did. And um, most botanical gardens, Arboretums, are started um, by wealthy families many years ago. And it was a competition of who can get what plant and kind of show off to another. And maybe there's 2% of people in the world that start Botanical Garden Arboretum. Um, and they tend to be crazy people. And they tend to also live in warmer climates so that their gardens grow quicker. Well, we, are, we know we're not, our garden collection is still very young. We consider ourselves a young botanical garden. And our goal is that when we're in mushroom bags in the ground, that Ulster County, and maybe with the help of the Garden Conservancy, will see the importance of the diversity of plantings that we've done over the time, and we'll take this on as Ulster County's um, botanical garden. So that is a little bit of background just to kind of flesh in what we're doing here. It's a little bit more than just a passion. Any questions? Yeah, any questions? That's enough about us. <laughs> Any questions about any of the plants? Everybody, you should be unmuted unless you want to unmute yourself. The, the cactus that you have, have you been by Iona Island in the Hudson River? Because it no. has a very large population of cactus there. No, no, no. no neat. So, um, if you want to, maybe you can, if you don't. What's happened here? You're on, you're on. You cannot. I don't think you can unmute can you hear people. Us now? Anyway, um, thank you for sure. Can you hear us now? Nod your head if you can. Okay. Thank you, um, whoever it was, for sharing about the island. It, where can you tell us a little bit more about it? No. Okay. okay. It's been so many years ago that since then I went down there to Iona Island. Hmm. It's in the Hudson River. Iona. It's, oh, okay. uh, it's it's near. Very cool. Thank it's, you. I'll look it up. It's near Bear Mountain. It's near Bear Mountain. Somewhere near Bear Mountain. Yeah. Me. 
Thank you for sharing that. That's great. I know people say there's a patch in Kingston. Yeah. Um, Two, yeah. Yeah, that was the first time I ever realized that cactus would grow in the north. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, it's just, yeah. There's well, a, hey, um, thanks everybody for uh, for showing up for this. It was a yeah, great talk, very, very informative. Um, it's going to be posted on YouTube at some point, um, um, along with our other um, presentations. So if you need to go back and find something out, you can do that. Um, hey, Madeline. Hi. Um, so uh, next month, um, I think we're going to be doing the, we're going to do a countdown of the 10 most invasive plants um, in the Hudson Valley if we don't find somebody else. Um, and after that will be the Catskill Forest Association, um, Ryan Trapani uh, talking about the history of forestry going back to the uh, Native Americans up to today. That's going to be a good one. Um, and let's see what else we have here. Um, Oh yeah. Um, also, um, the um, what's that here? The Farm Hub is going to do a presentation. Also, I think it's going to be in uh, December. Um, the uh, the ECC um, is 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 also creating a park in Kerhonkson uh, with wildflowers. Um, it's right around the new solar um, array. I don't know too much about that, but we're going to give a presentation on that in in November. Do you know anything else about that, Madeline? Uh, it about. is called the Watershed Educational Park, and it's just behind the new solar array um, where the Rainbow Diner used to be. Uh, nice. It should be opening sometime next year, but they are finalizing the trail placements. But there's, uh, I heard a rumor, there's going to be some river access down there. Um, but it's going to be a really beautiful spot. And Chris Hewitt uh, on the town board and also Andrew Faust who's a local permaculture expert, they're going to be joining us to talk about it because they've, they've been the ones who've been um, kind of spearheading the entire project. Cool. So we're looking forward to that. They're going to be speaking the week before Thanksgiving. Cool. Well, thank you so much yes. for joining yeah, us you. tonight. We're very appreciative, everybody. And thank you for hosting us as well. Thank you, everyone. And I'm, again, I'm very sorry for the technical issues at the get-go, but uh, we will be posting this to our, our YouTube page in the next couple days. So, And um, I just posted the email address for the ECC if you want to get on our mailing list. for Yeah, get on the mailing list and you can um, be um, apprised of all of the third Thursdays and anything else we do um, if we start getting back together in real, you know, in person again. Or when. when Hopefully we'll soon. <laughs> All right. Thanks again, everyone. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Thank you everybody. Yeah. Good night. Okay.